Uh, and it is a great pleasure. I am uh, going to introduce uh, Richard Watson, who I've got to read this out because it's a great job title, a future futurist in residence at that lovely institution, my own, Imperial College London. And Richard is going to be talking to us about, he's a best-selling author who has a keen focus on the impact that technology has on our economic, our economic, our society, on, on us as individuals. So over to you, Richard. Thank you, thank you. Right. Let me just get myself slightly organised here. Um, last one Wednesday, I was sitting at home, and that, the, the at home bit here is quite important. I was sitting at home, I spotted this, this article in a newspaper about a study that had been conducted by Oxford and Bath universities, and it suggested that if people worked from home rather than commuting to work in cars, 10,000 lives would be saved from air pollution. I'm a bit worried about that 10,000 number. It's a bit of a round one, but let's not, let's not worry about that. Um, the study went on to suggest that more lives could be saved if people socialised virtually too. Now, I'm sure the authors are well-meaning, um, but I suspect that they might also approve of e-books, online learning, and perhaps even adult chat lines and online gambling on a similar basis. Now, I have absolutely nothing against digitalization or virtualization per se. I, I would struggle to do what I do today without those things. And I think the internet in general as an invention is right up there with the printing press, the penny post, railways, clean water, airplanes, antibiotics, and ironically, cars. Um, and I'm a bit of a, a fan of clean air as well. Um, in fact, I'm working on a visualization of the future of air for the World Economic Forum at the moment. Um, the really good news about this is if you Google future of air, all you get is a band called air and a little bit about climate change. So if there's not much on Google about something, I think you possibly are onto something. Um, the World Economic Forum seem to have moved on from CO2 to H2O and now they're kind of interested in air. Um, but I think, you know, if, in, in sort of general terms, I think we might be getting our priorities inverted. Now, I'm obviously not against saving large numbers of lives, but suggesting that we live our lives inside, often alone, and with a significantly reduced potential for physical human contact might, in my view, create an even bigger problem. Now, the issue in a nutshell is that some people are starting to believe that human interaction is optional, or that physical human contact is inefficient and can be offset or avoided altogether by using digital or some form of virtual or automated alternative. And a good example of this possibly, it's a bit of a weird one, might be shopping. Um, we have been told, and an awful lot of us now believe, that visiting a supermarket is a phenomenally wasteful um, thing to do. Um, we are eating into our precious time and online alternatives would be a lot quicker. I did actually, by the way, get stuck in a queue a few weeks ago outside Sainsbury's because there's a box of flats where I live, very close to Sainsbury's. I mean, you can see Sainsbury's from the flats and a Sainsbury's van was delivering to the block of flats and it's quite a narrow road and it's got its doors open and this massive queue and I, that still makes my head explode. Anyway, my, my point really is that surely there is more to life than simply speeding it up. Surely, for example, shopping should be a social sensual and serendipitous experience, um, although I suppose nobody currently believes that. Um, in fact, it seems to me that many people now prefer the company of their own phone to their own partner. I think in theory, digitalization should be connecting the human race, but I think in workplaces, schools, living rooms, and even bedrooms across the country, it appears to be doing the absolute opposite. Now, this is happening now. What might happen next, if we choose not to act, is that we will design machines that really can think and one of the potential and rather ironic consequences of machines that can think might be the creation of a generation of people that doesn't. Although obviously we're not thinking about this at the moment. Now, arguing that people should socialise more virtually is for me much the same as suggesting that, that primary or secondary schools or even universities are outdated, we don't need these physical structures, that libraries are completely unnecessary for similar reasons, or that end-of-life care can easily be and efficiently be facilitated by a robot. Now, again, we just don't seem to be thinking about whether, or if we do think, we don't think very much, about whether or not these things might be a bad idea. Why is that? Probably because we're playing Candy Crush on our iPhones, we're following Love Island on Twitter, 
I'm actually watching Love Island. I'm not enjoying it, but it's a funny sort of thing. Um, or watching videos of cats on YouTube. I'm actually being forced to watch Love Island by my 15-year-old. My um, don't even go there. Um, now, now, I have no beef at all with online learning if it supplements or extends physical learning. Um, I also have no beef with it if there's no alternative. Uh, I've worked with an education company in Asia that's working in Africa that's using the internet to educate young kids because in the words of the late and occasionally delusional Margaret Thatcher, there is no alternative. Now, I have no fight to pick with Paro, the robotic seal either. This is used in care homes, um, particularly for, for elderly patients with dementia, and I have no problem with it if it's used in close conjunction with human oversight and human affection. But obviously there is a danger that an economic argument will prevail where this seal, this, ro this robotic seal, is far cheaper, and I hate this word, more efficient than humans. Now, my last book, which is called Digital Versus Human, available in the foyer, um, please, by the way, a pathetic attempt, uh, please buy them, they're quite heavy and I've got to carry them down to the car park, so please, please buy a book. There's no money in it for me, just please buy a book. Um, now, Digital Versus Human picks up on a few of these themes and it, and it digs into, amongst other things, how information changes according to the form it's presented in, which is a very old argument. Um, also, how connectivity and convenience, while beneficial on one level, might be bringing forth some of the nastier and more narcissistic sides of the human character. Another example from last week. I was once told that if you are ever in the unfortunate position of having to write an obituary or make a speech at a funeral, you should refrain from using words like I, me or my because it's not actually about you. Now, I was just cruising around the internet like I do and I noticed this last week in, in response to the death of the designer Kate Spade. Now, I don't know who Beth is. Um, I don't, I'm, even not, I'm not even on Twitter. I don't even know how I found this. Um, I'm sure she's a lovely person, and I'm sure she means well, but I got my most, my current, me smile, I see, my heart. It's all about Beth, basically. And I think this is symptomatic of a culture where people are desperate for visibility, they're desperate for validation, and most ironically of all, of course, they're desperate for connection. Now, as I said earlier, there are lots of positive, very positive aspects to digitalization, but there are some negative aspects too. Um, and I think this accelerating and deepening focus on the individual, individual, say that again, um, may well be amongst the worst. Now, individual empowerment sounds so lovely. So does personal technology. And it's interesting how all of these technologies that we use every day are now personal, because when I was growing up, they weren't. They were communal, and we had to sort of fight over them. It, you develop certain diplomatic skills, shall we say, about selecting television channels, the radio, or the use of the phone. Um, but we need to remember, I think, and we have almost seemed to have completely forgotten this, that you can only really be an individual in the context of other people. True individuality can only exist in the context of an enlightened and liberal whole. But I think social media, um, in particular, seems to be working ag against both enlightenment and liberalism. Now, I've been talking about this issue for more than a decade, but I, th I sense that the tide might finally be turning in a few places. And I think this is largely thanks to the recent behavior of a handful of organizations in California, all of whom might politely be described as being somewhat on the spectrum. Um, these are organizations that are technically brilliant, but they are socially awkward. They are naive, and at times totally and utterly inept. I'm sure you know who they are. Anyway, libraries and information. I used to live in Australia. 10 years ago or so, I created this timeline to stir up some conversation. Um, I, I, I like stirring things up, I like arguing with people, so I thought this would cause a really good argument, and it did. Um, I think if you talk to people about future or, or, or you read about the future, it's, it's almost always thought of in terms of new things that will appear, new inventions, primarily new technological things. But to my mind, the future is equally about things disappearing. It's stuff that we are incredibly familiar with, stuff that might have been around for hundreds of years that starts to disappear or be become extinct. And feeling a little bit naughty, I stuck libraries on the list almost as, as a question. <sighs> I heard that sharp intake of breath. Um, 
The problem is I've got no memory. And shortly after doing it, I was asked to speak to a room full of librarians in Australia, and I forgot that I put libraries on the list. The only thing that saved me is I also put futurists a little bit later on, but <laughs> trying to sort of even things up. Now, under normal conditions, and, and particularly in nowadays, I would have most probably been verbally abused on Twitter or thrown out of the room. But remember, these were librarians. I was just politely asked to explain myself. And I, I did this, and I ended up with a really interesting three-month project looking at scenarios for the future of public libraries in New South Wales. <laughs> now, I know, this is, this is a bit niche, but I think it was illuminating nevertheless, and in the end, possibly of universal importance. The project essentially became a project about human values, human freedoms, and most of all, human connection. Now, this is, this is I think it was 2009, remember, and it was Australia. And at the time, libraries in Australia were under a bit of pressure, but not to the degree that they were here, and not even to the degree that they, they remain here. And it was for public libraries. It wasn't for academic or, or university libraries either. Nevertheless, halfway through the process, I, I had something of a, a sort of revelation or an epiphany. Now, you've got to cast your minds back to about 2009, 2010 here. At the time, the e-book was a reasonably new idea, and sales were going through the roof. And quite a lot of people, particularly people in the media, were questioning whether the physical book was dead and, and with, it, with it physical book publishers. You know, should they be placed on the endangered list? But it suddenly occurred to me about halfway through this project, this seems to happen quite a lot actually with these sort of projects, it suddenly occurred to me that the future of books wasn't necessarily the same thing as the future of libraries. And that libraries and librarians were something rather unique and rather special. Um, again, I'm talking about public libraries here, not, not university or academic libraries, but I think there is a tremendous overlap between the two. In short, I realised that libraries are not just about books. They are, obviously, that's, that's their very foundation, that's their history, but they have evolved into something else that, that's hugely important, which is people. Now, libraries are about books, they're about information, they're about knowledge, they're quite often about artefacts and local history too, but they also contain people. In fact, I think if you took people out, that's no longer a library. Um, and it's people that are searching for things. That, that's critical as well. And I think that often the thing they're searching for, it turns out, is themselves. Moreover, in a world where public spaces are becoming increasingly commercialised, libraries, be they public or academic, offer a form of respite. They are, to a greater or lesser degree, neutral, community spaces. They're also, to some extent, quiet spaces, which is becoming increasingly rare as well. They are spaces where people are judged, you know, not by who they currently are or, or what they look like, but what they might one day become. They are, in a sense, self-improvement centres. Libraries are not stacks of information, but stacks of potential. They are not merely collections, but collections of possibility. And they are inherently optimistic places, in, in my view. Most of all, and most importantly, I think libraries offer humility and humanity, two things that I fear we are in danger of losing due to a number of factors, and, and, and two things that could very easily be placed on the extinction timeline. Um, and I think humility and humanity are at risk because, primarily because of the convenience, um, anonymity, and perfection that is created by digitalization. Now, coming back to my book for a moment, it opens with a story you might vaguely remember. Um, it's a story about a South Korean couple who met online, of course, um, and they had a baby daughter, and they allowed their baby daughter to starve to death. They had become obsessed with raising an avatar child in a virtual world called Prius Online, and their virtual child was apparently far more satisfying than their real-life one. And according to police reports at the time, um, the pair would leave their real daughter at home alone while they spent up to 12-hour sessions caring for their digital daughter, who was rather cutely named Anima, from a cyber cafe in Seoul. Now, it's really easy to dismiss this story uh, as, as being about people taking their love for computer games far too far. But I think this, this reading of the tale as a kind of teary technological fable could be quite misleading. A more careful reading might see that it's about identity, it's about purpose, and it's about intimacy in an age of super smart, emotionally programmed machines. It's also about social interaction, addiction, displacement, and how some people can only deal with so much reality. 
And most of all, I think, it's about how our ancient brains are not terribly well equipped to distinguish between real relationships or parasocial or imagined ones. You know, we may have the technology of the gods, but I'm afraid we still have the brains of the Paleolithic. This mismatch beyond all else is what I'm interested in, and it's what I want to talk to you about today. I am not especially interested in technology per se. I'm interested in what technology can do, and fundamentally, I'm interested in people and how people use technology to interact or not with each other. Now, what's this got to do with libraries or, or information? I think it has everything to do with both, in my view. What is the purpose of information or knowledge? Surely it is to learn something about something or someone, but to what end? Now, I don't want to get too metaphysical because I don't think the bar's open yet, but I think the purpose in the end must have something to do with truth, goodness, reality, or an understanding of the human condition. Um, and it's surely similar with technology, or at least it should be. Technology is not a tool. It is generally a way of doing something that we can't do without it, or more often, it's, it's a way of making something easier to do. I think Silicon Valley was once rather cru cruelly described as um, doing the stuff that your mother no longer does for you, which makes me smile a little bit. Some truth in that, possibly. Um, it cannot be an end in itself, surely. So the question that concerns me most about digital is, what's it for at a very deep level? Now, it's all very well organising the world's information to make it universally accessible and useful, but I would think there's something beyond this, surely. By the way, I, I do think it's a little bit disingenuous to casually say you are organising the world's information. First of all, is it not in your interest to organise in things in a certain way if you are a profit-maximising company? Secondly, is it not a conceit to imply that a certain company is the entire universe, information universe, and that said company is the only way through said universe. Somebody called Virginia Hefferman um, was writing in Wired magazine last year, and she, she basically said that Silicon Valley's engineers barely touch two of the five human senses, and that there are parallel universes of information out there that will never, ever be digitalized. Equally, I think it's all well and good to say that your mission is to bring the world closer together and to move fast and break things, but to what end? And what if the one thing you end up breaking is society? Ooh, that was close. There's Mark Zuckerberg getting his revenge in there. I need to drop that on the floor. Um, I mean, this is classic Silicon Valley. Sell the illusion of freedom and control when the reality is you're actually supplying the total opposite. Now, I think we all need to think. Now, we think we think, obviously, but the increasing reality is that we are beginning to think in echo chambers and in bubbles and in a shallow, fragmented and distracted manner. We are not thinking about what it is we want this technology to do on our behalf or what this technology might be capable of in the future. I mean, we do think about that a bit, but not very much. Now, you might think I'd be hugely cynical about AI in this context, and I understand you've been having a bit of a discussion on AI today. Um, and I am cynical about AI on, on, on some levels, but push aside the hype and, and quite often narrow commercial interests. And my hope is that some kind of broad or general AI will shine a very bright spotlight on what we are all for. AI, true AI, will illuminate the human condition and hopefully cast narrow, shallow, short-term interests into the shadows. Now, there aren't too many certainties nowadays. I mean, even Trump is starting to surprise me. But one thing I am confident about is that there won't be a robot, ro robot, I can't say it, there won't be a robot uprising within my lifetime. I think another thing I'm pretty damn confident about is that it's extremely unlikely that anyone in this room will need retraining or will need to find alternative employment due to AI anytime soon. And hopefully that includes myself. Um, and I think this is because, in large part, what you do and what I do cannot easily be replicated by an automated system, um, digital processes, virtualization, etc. Now, this isn't to say that some governments, and particularly some companies, won't try. But I think it's incumbent upon us to point out that it's in nobody's interests over the longer term. I think the job of a librarian, no matter where you work, is to connect people with reliable information. But I think it's also surely to help people find a better life through education, work or pursuits, be they trivial or, trivial or otherwise. Now, an algorithm could theoretically do all of this and more, but I think most likely the experience would be somewhat sterile and rather joyless. 
Um, and I agree that we've barely scratched the surface in terms of what can be digitalized um, or automated, but I, th you know, I think we need to think more about what the ultimate cost of, of doing so. Um, could and should are quite different things, and I, I think we should spend much more time thinking about what we want to happen in the future and less time speculating about what might happen, because we're usually wrong, by the way. Um, now, I read something else in, in the newspapers this week. Um, it was about, I think it was even yesterday, um, it was about an airline using virtual windows instead of real ones. So instead of looking outside, this was Emirates, instead of looking outside, in first, by the way, so we don't really care about them, but anyway, um, instead of looking outside, passengers would essentially look at projections of what was outside projected onto the cabin um, walls. And the reason for doing this, it's, it's the usual, usual reasons, um, cost primarily. Um, the plane is lighter, um, therefore more fuel efficient, and also, by the way, it sort of flies a bit faster. So it's back to supermarkets, it's just saving us time, but to what end? Now, personally, I think this is another sterile, joyless, and somewhat diminishing idea. And I'm, I'm probably wasting my time, same time saying this, though. Um, looking out of windows should probably be on this list. Most people these days don't. I, I spend an awful lot of time in planes, on trains, on buses, and most people do not look out of windows. They don't look up, they look down. But back to AI. Um, AI is hugely capable of doing an enormous number of things. Um, if you really dug into it, I don't think there's very much you and I do on a daily basis that an AI couldn't learn to do if we allowed it. But the good news is there are, to my mind, three things that no machine will ever do, and we should really press to make sure this never changes. You've probably heard of Asimov's three laws. These are, these are Watson's three rules for AI. First, AIs cannot be creative. They cannot invent. Now, they can, but not on a high level. Um, they're just too logical. You know, there was a, a university in, in um, the Netherlands, and it taught an AI to study Rembrandt in depth and create a new picture in the style of Rembrandt using a 3D printer. So this is, this is not a machine that's copying a Rembrandt. This is copying the style of the painter and painting something entirely new. And I, I can't remember if it actually fooled some Rembrandt experts. I think it did, but it, it, it certainly had the potential to fool, fool some Rembrandt experts. Um, but the thing is, no AI, to my mind at least, could ever invent cubism. Because cubism is not a logical development. Cubism, and indeed all high-level creativity in general, is partly based, based upon pattern destruction, not pattern recognition. Moreover, surely the purpose of art is to communicate ideas, especially ideas about truth, beauty, belief, or the nature of human existence. Now, AIs can't do this because like the Tin Man in The Wizard of Oz, they don't have a heart. I must actually watch The Wizard of Oz again because I think the Tin Man might get a heart at the end, which ruins that argument, but <laughs> just, you know, just, just kind of go with me on that. Um, second, AIs cannot be empathetic. Again, this is disputable. There's something called effective computing, which is trying to fake that, but just, just hold that thought. AIs cannot love. They can sense, but they cannot truly feel. You know, they, they can sense that it's snowing outside, but that doesn't really mean anything to them. Um, there's no consequence. Um, they certainly cannot know what it feels like to be you or I. Um, and what I think this means is that while AIs will be able to argue with us and provide wise counsel, I don't really think they'll ever be truly able to motivate or inspire us. So we can use AI to workplace analytics to work out who's doing a good job, but I, I, I don't really want to follow an AI in any sort of meaningful sense. Now, I'm sure that someday um, we will design machines that, with alluring characters and characteristics and personalities, but my hope is that we're going to see through this on some sort of deep human level. My third and final law, rule, whatever, is that AIs cannot and should never be moral. Al algorithms can follow the letter of the law. A lot of law is rule-based. It's perfect for algorithms. Um, I'm sure they'll be able to resolve logical disputes uh, or maintain order if we allow them to do. But I do not believe that a machine or, or a bit of code should ever be allowed to create human rights or freedoms. Now, this is not to say that future machines won't contain legal code. As machines become more autonomous and make their own life or death decisions, and I'm thinking here in particular of autonomous transport but also autonomous weapons, um, they're going to have to contain legal code. 
they're going to have to decide what to do by themselves in certain situations, and we're not going to be able to advise them. But we must remain the ultimate arbiters of what is right and wrong. We must remain the guardians of the spirit in which laws are made and interpreted. Now, towards the end of my book, I make reference to the world's smallest music venue. And it, it was dreamt up a few years ago by two musicians called Emily and Dom. And it's a very tiny wooden box. And inside the wooden box is one musician, and 30 centimetres away, just one audience member who listens to one song in the ethereal darkness. The idea is both illogical and visceral. I don't think any machine could ever come up with that idea. And as one person observed, the, the tiny box is rather disorientating. It, it blurs the line between what's weird and rather wonderful. And the shadowy darkness makes some people burst into laughter, others burst into tears, which is quite interesting. I'm not, I'm not quite sure why, but that's apparently what happens. And I think in the age of machines that, that demean and diminish the human spirit, this tiny jerry-built wooden box proves that physical intimacy still matters and that the answer we're all searching for has something to do with human contact. It also proves, I think, that realness and authenticity are what we must fight to preserve. Mathematicians, engineers, physicists, politicians, financiers are all needed to solve the world's big problems. But I think we also need poets, painters, novelists, filmmakers and musicians who can reach out and touch the human heart. It is only they who can travel deep inside our heads and look outwards. It is only they who can ask the biggest question of all, which is us. This is, to my mind, a question that no computer seeking a logical or specific endpoint will ever be able to answer. And that's because being human is not a logical problem. Moreover, the answer will be different every time the question is asked. And perhaps this is what libraries and librarians are really for. You help people with the ultimate searching question, which is who or what can I be? Now, I was going to end things there but I realised I was going to sort of run short. Um, and also, there was something else I wanted to say. Um, this has really nothing to do with libraries, but it has everything to do with the acad academic institutions you serve. Um, rather weirdly, I, I started rereading Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance a few days ago. I found a receipt in it from Dylan's from 20 years ago, so I know exactly when I was last reading it. Um, and there's a line in the book, I actually, I did bring the book, and it's, it's in my boot in the car park, but I was struggling so much to bring the books up, I couldn't manage to bring that as well. Um, it's got a line about education, I just sort of randomly found this, and, and the line is as follows. A student completely conditioned to work for a grade rather than for the knowledge the grade was supposed to represent. I'll say that again. A student completely conditioned to work for a grade rather than for the knowledge the grade was supposed to represent. Now, I know that's a bit out of context, um, but for me, it highlights a problem that goes to the heart of what I believe is currently wrong with education in this country and most, most other countries, and also what's wrong with the society that education serves. In other, another of my questions, what is the purpose of education? For me, the purpose of education should first and for foremost be the creation of a fair and just society. Now, you might argue that the primary purpose of education should be employment. And we, we've certainly been moving in that direction for a very long time. But I think this idea is failing fast and we need to try a bit hard to come up with something additional that's a little more inspiring for future generations. The role and purpose of education beyond the creation of a fair and just society should be to teach people to think and think well. That's what it was originally for in my mind. And this hopefully will create and continue reinforce a fair, just, equal and inclusive society. But we seem to have forgotten this hugely important lesson. Instead, we have become fixated on the idea that education at all levels is about grades. Grades that grant access to the next stage of education and ultimately into that job. Now, I don't really want to end on a downer, but I, I feel I absolutely have no choice in this. Um, why have student suicide numbers nearly doubled in UK universities over the past decade? That is scandalous. The reason, and I, I don't know the real reason, but it appears to be rising levels of anxiety, which are in turn linked to uh, the pressure to perform and get the best grades. Um, student debt might play into this a bit, but I, I don't think that's the primary reason. Now, th this is ridiculous. How have we let this happen? It's a scandal. 
Now, I don't think this has much to do with digitalization per se, although I'm, I'm sure there is some linkage. Um, for example, social media promotes what I call perfect moment syndrome. And it's also fixated with the now. And I think that just adds to the pressure on every single level. Now, this is clearly not just a problem within our universities. It's, it's a problem within most universities. Um, and it's a national, even a global problem. But I think in the UK, within education, we have sold children, and it appears from the age of about five upwards, I might add, on the idea that education is not about knowledge, thinking, character, ethics, or lifelong learning, but rather about a series of memory tests early on in the, their long lives. If you fail these tests, you may as well give up. You will never amount to anything of substance or significance. You are and will always remain a failure, an infer inferior human being. That is absolute rubbish, and I'm, I'm really quite cross about this. N many of the most intelligent, interesting, alluring, and success people, successful people I have ever met failed at school or university or both. Or they passed their exam with, exams with flying colours, got a great job, and ultimately decided it wasn't for them because they were surrounded by individuals who believed in nothing but themselves. Now, I'm not against pressure or failure at all. I think both create resilience, which is, is needed in today's world. And I think both, to some extent, um, are catalysts for originality. But I deeply resent a world where children and young adults are led to believe that their entire lives will be determined by a single test or a brief series of tests. This has to stop. And again, I think our priorities have become somewhat inverted. I do a lot of work with HR. I speak to a lot of employers. And it seems that academic achievement is often the least of their concerns. What they want are soft skills. They want people that are personable. They want people that can think on their feet, people that are agile, open-minded, creative, empathetic, and most of all, perhaps, interesting and inspiring. These days, you can go through university without ever encountering any of these things, it seems to me. And the really interesting thing about all of those things, though, is these are things that computers are absolutely dreadful at. What computers are really good at, very, very good at, and are going to get an awful lot better at in the future, is acquiring information or data and performing certain logical tasks based upon this information or data or patterns found within the information or data. In other words, computers, machines, automated processes, are best at precisely the thing we are teaching students to do right now. We are essentially teaching our children and our children's children to become long-term unemployed. I mean, the stupidity here is simply astonishing. Um, you know, maybe we need to teach less and educate more. There is a school I do know that rather, rather beautifully says we, we teach them in the mornings and educate them in the afternoons, which we, there should be more of that. Maybe we should focus more on EQ and less on IQ. Maybe we should mark people instead of papers. You know, I don't know what we should do, but I do know that we need to do something and fast. I'm sorry to end it there, but I felt that needed to be said. Thank you. Um, I think I've allowed a fair bit of time for questions. Yeah. Yes. I am blinded by the light, so I won't be able to yes. see who's asking it, but... Would it be easy if you sat down? This yeah, actually, that's a very good idea. <laughs> Sorry. Control freak me. Uh, any questions, please? You wowed everybody. About else. anything, actually, okay. apart, from <laughs> apart from fashion, which I don't touch. I can do those. Okay. Uh, Anne. I, I'm really interested in something you mentioned. You know your Korean couple, and this simulacrum of um, real real relationships, real yep. meaningful engagement. Do you have, are you largely pessimistic about humans' willingness to just a, accept a copy of real emotion as, a, as enough? Or do you think we're smarter than that? I don't know, but I'm very concerned about it. My cop-out answer is I'm sort of pessimistic in the short term and op optimistic in the longer term. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I am constantly staggered by how people fall for this. Um, I, 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 actually, I mean, forget, ro robots are not an issue. The, the issue is, is avatars and algorithms. And I mean, there's a very good film called Her, you should all watch, 
which is where somebody essentially falls for Siri. Um, you know, you can create very alluring avatars on your phone. Um, you know, there's a problem in Japan at the moment with um, virtual girlfriends that a lot of Japanese mi men find far more convenient and less trouble than, than real women. By the way, it's, it's a man problem. That doesn't work the other way around, interestingly. <laughs> um, yeah, we seem to fall for it. I mean, you know, the whole, di the whole phone smartphone thing, that, you know, these, are, these aren't accidents. These have been deliberately designed to be quite addictive. Um, although, interestingly, we're, we're beginning to see, I mean, I was talking about digital diets 10 years ago. We're begin I've been asked by a big internet company to, to do something on digital health. So they are waking up to this and, and about time. But, you know, maybe, I mean, uh, recent history has all been towards the individual and it's, it's, sol it's sol what's that word? Solipsism. It's, it's, you know, I am my own little universe. And technology is facilitating that to a large degree. But I, my optimism comes from the fact that I'm old enough to, to notice that a lot of things don't end up where you expect. And we sort of rebalance things. So globalization creates counterforce, which is, which is localization, fast food, slow food. It's a bit like a sort of Newtonian law, that the stronger the trend or the faster it's moving, the more resistance builds up. Now, it, it rarely takes over from the original trend, but it's, it's a breaking or balancing force. And I think there is something innate in us that will we'll work out this stuff isn't probably good for us in the longer term. Um, I'm just wondering what you think about the idea that actually in real life, as opposed to digital, in movies, in box sets, people are looking for idols, people look for um, their hero in different things. And I think that's been ongoing throughout the centuries and going back to mythology and everything. Yeah. Is it not another interpretation, another way in the digital world of having another kind of thing that may inspire you? as I well, or equally. You've got to be yeah. really careful here, because I, I'll use words like we, and I actually mean me. Um, <laughs> I, I'm a middle-aged, white, Western male. I do not speak for the entire human race who will see things differently. But I, I think that's always been true, and I think at the moment we are, are rather lost, and we are looking for that. And I think one, the other reason I think there's an awful lot of anxiety around is that if you go, I'm not quite sure when the date was, but we'll, we'll call it 2000, because that's a nice round number, but you know, we had the Berlin Wall in 89, we had 9-11, we had, we had the global financial cra cra crash in 708. Um, I think, you know, if you, if you go back to about sort of 99, 2000 or something, most people in the West had, particularly in middle class households, had a view of the future. They could see where they were going. Now, with hindsight, they were delusional because it didn't work like that. Um, and and by the, where they thought they were going, by the way, was like now with the volume turned up. It was, a, it was a logical progression. And then all these weird things started happening. And I think at the moment, we're just in this fog, and we cannot see where we're going. And that creates deep anxiety. And no politician really is articulating any vision. There are a few companies articulating vision in, in California, but there aren't many of those around the world. Um, and I think we need a vision, and I think we need to be led up to a point. And, and going back to AI, um, I, I think that is going to crystallize what we are for. It will give us that vision. But I think we also need, it sounds very grand, but I think, I think we need a strategy for the human race this century because there's an awful lot of stuff we do that other, the machines can do instead. And I think we need to decide where we're going, how we're going to get there, and what we will or won't allow. And that would be a wonderful thing to have. I'm not necessarily very confident we're going to get it, but that would be a lovely thing to work towards. So, yeah, I, I think people are searching for some, some kind of narrative Chef, just here. The next table long on your can't invert right left. Picking up on your kind of Western focus bit, Richard, where you're talking about a vision. Is there anywhere in the world where we can look to see not necessarily the vision, but the, at least the glimmer that somebody in the world, you know, thinking kind of nation state more than companies might have a um, sense of what the vision is? I think I would have historically said the US, but I'm not sure about them anymore. <laughs> Um, I think they're as confused as anybody. Um, uh, Silicon Valley, I think, has a very clear vision. Um, I think Asia, a lot of Asia is, is not focused on the individual. It's, it's focused on the group. Japan, um, China up to a point. I'm not sure about China. Um, certainly Japan. Um, yeah, there are. 
and, and the other thing is that plays into this is, is sort of religion to some extent. I think that, that provides the narrative. It's just in, in the West, and particularly in the UK, we, we've sort of fallen out of love with religion a bit, whereas that's not true around the world necessarily. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would broadly and generally say Asia, parts of Asia. There was a, this table over here, I think there were a couple of hands up. I mean, I think we need to shift it back from me to we. And at the moment, we're just going down the, we, the me path, and we need to pull that back. Hello, I was interested in your view about the current state of education. And as a former school governor and parent and seeing students come in, I sort of agree <laughs> with what you're saying, but what can we do to change things? Because um, I think they've gone really, they're going really badly. Uh, you can buy my book, because the best <laughs> chapter in it is on education. <laughs> Please, and, somebody buy and the book. Actually, I, it, it, seriously, it's the, the, one, the chapter on money is pants. Don't even read that. But the one on the education <laughs> is quite good. And it's, it comes from the heart because I've got two kids that have been in two different education systems, three actually. Um, so I've sort of been there, done that, and seen it to some extent. Um, I mean, much, much of what I said, I think, I think we, we've, we've got to move the focus away from, from tests and exams and grades a bit. I think they're, they're useful. I think we could consider ditching GCSEs altogether. Um, I think we should teach values and, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure you could mark somebody based on their personality and character, but we could have a go. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting with, uh, have we got a camera rolling, by the way, at the moment? Um, so, so we can, turn it off. can you turn it off for a minute?